welcome back. Um, got an awesome guest today. Very excited about this one. Um, our guest today is truly one of a kind. Uh, I don't know how many people have lived on earth, but he's one, one in that many. Uh, he's early in life battled with cancer, two, two forms of deadly cancer where he was told he may, may pass away early in life. After overcoming both of those, went on to, uh, with one functioning lung, summit each of the seven tallest mountains on each continent, trek the north and south poles, and and completed the high Hawaii Ironman. So um, could be described as a modern day su superhero. And uh, so I'm very excited to have you here, Sean. This is Sean Swarner. I uh, appreciate you joining us. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. And it's, it's, it's funny how people like they rattle all that stuff off and I'm thinking, wow, who's this guy they're talking about? <laughs> like, oh yeah. Well, to the, to the, to the common man, it's just like, what, like any, you know, one of those things would be enough to, to tell your life story. And, and instead you just keep racking them up. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if, Let's just hypothetically say you were given 14 days to live. You know, like I, w I was when I was 16. You know, let's, let's just say you were given 14 days to live. And while your friends were out, you know, chasing girls, collecting baseball cards, worrying about being popular, worrying about the nicest hairstyle clothes, you're literally terrified to close your eyes every night because you don't know if they're going to open up again the next morning or not. You know, you, you, you tend to see life a little bit differently and you go after things a little bit uh, with a little bit more passion than most people, I think. Yeah, that is intense. And, and, and the age at which, you know, you started that you got cancer and all that, right? It's 13 the first time. Yeah, the first, exactly. The first one was 13. So I essentially had cancer from, let's just say 13 to 18 years old, you know, so through the whole developmental years of my life. So, like I said, I, I, from the get go, you know, my, my friends were growing up, they were dating girls, they were, their hormones were kicking in, they were growing hair in unusual places on their bodies. You know, I, and here I was losing all my hair, 60, 70 pounds overweight, bald from head to toe. Like I said, you, from, you look from the medications and stuff. Yeah, yeah. From the prednisone, from the chemotherapy, you know, you, you really tend to look at life a little bit differently than most people. And I, I remember a conversation I had with a guy not too long ago. Um, and I don't want not to get too religious, but he goes, you know, after everything you've been through, he asked me two questions after everything you've been through two cancers, you know, you were given three months to live 14 days to live. And I, I was in a medically induced coma for a year of my life. And I was read my last rites. He's like, how can you be so positive? How can you believe in God? And I'm like, how could I not? Yeah. You have a choice and in, in whatever you're going through, you always have a choice in how you want to come out. You might, I, I didn't have a choice of, of going through those cancers. It, it happened, but I had a choice in how I, how I reacted to it. You know, the whole thing with, with the pandemic, people are saying, oh, we're in a, a state of uncertainty. The world's in a global uncertainty. Uh, but like, like I said earlier, what's uncertain is not knowing if you're going to wake up the next day or not. But again, you don't have control over that. You have control over how much toilet paper you're buying. <laughs> and then right. you're like, none of us, none of us have a guarantee, right? And I guess uh, maybe for you having come that close or at least being told, you know, by so many different factors that like this, this could be the end and you really might not wake up tomorrow. You know, a lot of us don't, we don't get that close and then come back from it and say like, oh, well, maybe I should start living then <laughs> because because it, it could happen at any time right like i mean i look at my own life i almost can't even like can't comprehend it because like i i ruptured my spleen in high school about the same age i was 14 but i didn't even like i don't know i i was in this mental state of like ah you know teenagers don't die it's like I, you know i spent a few days in the hospital i went home and, and took it easy for a couple months and i was back back to life, you know, and, and, uh, I didn't actually internalize like, man, this is a near death experience, but yours maybe was prolonged enough that, and you were literally told there's, there's a very small chance you're coming back from this. Right. I mean, what did the doctors tell you when you're 18, you're in the bed and, and, and what, or uh, sorry, 13 in that bed and you got cancer. 
See, I, I, that's a great question. And I, I honestly think this is one of the components of why I'm alive. If, if you look at how, let's just say you go to the doctor, let, let, let's just say, um, you're sitting down in the doctor's office and you, you try to figure out what's going on with your body. You're feeling weird. For me, it was just a happen. It was just happenstance. I, I suffered a knee injury, knee injury triggered every joint in my body to go so haywire. So that's why they stuck me in the hospital. And after they, they were trying to treat me for pneumonia, which I mean, you can't cure cancer by sucking on a nebulizer. So I wasn't getting any better, right. but let's just hypothetically say, you know, knock on wood, it never happens, but you're in the doctor's office. And like Bronson, I'm, I'm sorry, you have cancer. You know, this is, this is what you have, blah, blah, blah. This is what we're going to do to fix it. You've already tuned out. You've, you've done. You heard that word, the C word. But for me, they, the doctors, the oncologist told my parents that I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, which was a cancer. And then my parents told me, you're sick. It's Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is what we're going to do. It's treatable. And oh, by the way, it's cancer. So I heard all that positive stuff before I heard the negative. And I think that really helped. And I wish doctors now would, would tell patients in a similar fashion where it's kind of uh, like a footnote. Hey, by the way, this is what it is. As opposed to what they do now is like, oh, your, your condition so dire. This is everything that's going to happen to you. You could potentially die. I mean, you, you see the commercials on um, television or the radio or, or even, you know, when you're watching um, YouTube or anything online, they, they say, you know, this cures um, eczema. Oh, and by the way, this is, this is, these are the side effects. You know, you have suicidal tendencies, suicidal actions. Hey, those are all the things that people focus on. So that's, that's when, when I was going through my cancers, they did it kind of the back, backwards way. You know, flipped it, they flipped it around. Interesting. This is your condition. This is what's going on. We're going to do everything we can to treat it. And oh, by the way, it's cancer. And I think that really helped because I, I remember when I was 13, I was 60 pounds overweight, literally bald from head to toe, on my hands and knees on the bottom of the shower floor, sobbing, just weeping. And I was pulling chunks of hair out of the drain so the water could go down. Then the water, the, the bathtub, the um, shower was filling up because just all the hair in one day, one, one time in the shower, it fell out. And I also thought that in that same moment, when I was 13, I had a choice to either fight for my life or give up and die. It was, it was, it was an awful decision to make, but I chose obviously to fight. And I also decided that I didn't want to focus on not dying. I wanted to focus on living. Because wherever your attention is, is where you're going to end up. A perfect example, you're driving and it's wintertime, you're driving and all of a sudden you hit the ice or the snow, your car starts sliding. Wherever your focus is, where you're going to be, the wheel's going to go that way. You're going to, your attention is drawn that way. It's what's going to be pulling you towards that, that destination. Same thing in life. You know, I can guarantee entrepreneurs don't go into business thinking, oh man, I don't want to lose money. <laughs> they want to they focus on making money. Same thing right. with everything yeah. in life. Don't focus on the avoidance of what you don't want. Focus on what you do want. And I did that at such a young age, fighting for my life. Right. You know, I just had a, I, I interviewed a, um, a psychotherapist recently and she was talking about, you know, that we literally take in billions or, you know, we take in billions of bits of information in a daily basis, but our brain can only actually comprehend a very tiny fraction of that. And in that sense, what you focus on is your reality. You know, you tell yourself a story based on this small fraction of life, really. Um, and that becomes your true reality, right? And and it's also the example of like what you focus on expands, right? Like if you buy a red car, suddenly everyone's got a red car and you're like, what the, I thought I bought a unique car, right? Like, uh, because you, you can only comprehend a certain amount. So, I mean, it sounds to me like you're focusing on the good stuff, the living, the getting through the strength, the, you know, all the, the power that you can muster. And, uh, instead of saying like, here's the, here's the sickness, the weakness, the, the death, the dying, right. Um, which very few of us again, come up against something so so extreme at that, that age in life. So that's, I'm, I mean, I'm already inspired at age 13, you know, it's like, man, that's a, that's a tough place to be in an amazing accomplishment, but then you get cancer again. So 
so separate separate these two cancers for me what what happened so the first one was hodgkin's lymphoma advanced stage four which is cancer of the lymph lymph system which is you know your spleen all your lymph nodes everything basically your whole body Mm -hmm. Um, the second cancer was completely unrelated to the first cancer. So I had two primary cancers. It wasn't, um, caused from the treatment from the first one. It wasn't related to it. In fact, um, I think I'm still the only person who's ever had Hodgkin's disease and Askin sarcoma. So the second one was Askin sarcoma, which is a branch of Ewing sarcoma, which affects three out of a million people with a prognosis of 6%. Wow. And because the doctors had never seen anyone with Hodgkin's and Askins before, they had no idea what was going to happen. I became a, a, a chemical cocktail dump, you know, of, of chemotherapy. And even to this day, because no one's ever had these two, I go in once a year for a checkup and I will never be cured. I will always be in remission. So every time I go in for a checkup, you know, it's for me, it's it's another year to live, you know, another opportunity to, to, to live as 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 passionately as I possibly can. So the second time around in one day, they, I remember they found a tumor on an x-ray the size of a golf ball on my right lung. They did a needle biopsy. They took out a lymph node. They put in a Hickman catheter, which is like a permanent IV. They cracked open my ribs, removed the tumor, put in, installed, put in a drainage tube and started chemotherapy in less than, less than 24 hours. And this time around, the doctors put me in a medically induced, first of all, they they gave me 14 days to live. Um, I was read my last rites. I remember laying in the hospital bed, a man on the cloth came in, did his whole thing. And I looked at my mom and my dad, I was like, you know, (laughs) basically what the hell is he doing? I'm not dead yet. You know, get get, get out of here. So then I went in for three months of intense chemo, one month of intense radiation, and then 10 more months of chemotherapy. And every time I was in the hospital for uh, that three month and the 10 month, I I was put in a medically induced coma because the treatments were so hard. I don't remember being 16 years old, except for that one month of radiation. So I, you know, some people wish they could forget being 16, but I don't even have that choice. I just, I don't remember being, being 16, except for that one month. What the hell? (laughs) This this is mind blowing, man. You, you spent your six, your 16th year in a coma after. So, so do you consider that your first world record? You have, you're the only one to have <laughs> those two cancers, like <laughs> starting yeah, it off no, with no. a splash, man, that's intense. So you, you miss your entire year, uh, cause you're in a coma with, with another can form of cancer. And so when did you start, start like feeling like well again and able to get after it, you know, get it back to your sports and all that. That, you know, that's a great question because literally my first goal was to crawl six feet, six or eight feet from the hospital bed to the bathroom. You know, I, I, because I didn't want to soil the sheets. I was tired of throwing up on myself. I was tired of defecating the bed. I couldn't move. So that was my first goal was to go to the bathroom by myself. You know, and then I ended up climbing, as as you mentioned earlier, climbing over 29,000 feet to the top of the world. But my first goal was to make it to the bathroom and then to walk around the nurse's station, then, you know, explore the, the hospital floors and kind of move around. After I was placed in remission, a year later, I actually won my high school's league track meet in the 800 meter run. So I pushed myself. Nice. And I didn't go directly from, you know, the hospital bed to winning the 800 meters. I went from there to, you know, running around my block, to running around my block twice, to pushing myself around the track, pushing myself into a mile, you know, two miles, five miles, 10 miles. You know, I pushed myself a little bit by a little bit and eventually came out on top. Interesting, man. So the world thought, the universe thought that cancer would be your kryptonite and it turned out to just to be a motivator and you ended up flipping that mind switch set to, I gotta, I gotta live, live with all I can. And you start getting back into track. And then when, when does this dream of I'm going to climb Everest? Like, I mean, I've, I've dreamt of it as like literally the dream of like, ah, you know, that, that seems cool to, to climb Everest. But then I think of like all the dead people up there and all that. And I go, you know what? I got four kids. I'm going to stay in my comfy house. So like when, (laughs) when did you decide maybe I'll 
Maybe I'll summit Everest. It, it took a while after the second cancer because I, I, I went to college after, after high school. And have you ever seen the movie Animal House? No, I haven't. Okay. You, you have to see. It's, it's a classic. It's basically about these crazy guys who are partying in college. You know, I, that, that was me. Like I, I, I found, I tried to relive my high school years in college. I was the party animal. I was the guy swinging from the rafters, you know, people throwing beer cans at me when I'm partying with my friends. I started off molecular bio and I did that for about three years. And when you're, when you're partying so much, it's, it's really difficult to, to study and, and pass immunology and organic chemistry. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> I, I switched to psychology and I, I wanted to be a psychologist for cancer patients. Figured I, I, I've been through a lot, you know, and, and as we all know, uh, yeah. cancer is not an individual disease. You know, the family goes through it. So my mom, my dad, my, my younger brother went through it with me. It was an, a, a whole bonding experience. Um, while I was studying for my master's, my doctorate, that's when I, I kind of, I, I quit school and the reason I quit was because I, I didn't take care of myself. I had no idea what cancer did to me. You know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't take that proverbial hard look in the mirror and figure things out on my own. So because I thought I'd been blessed with a, a great mind body connection and I can go on to accomplish amazing things, I wanted to use Everest as literally the highest platform in the world to scream hope, you know, to give hope back to, the people fighting for their lives to give, to let people know that cancer is not necessarily the end. You know, it, it could be the beginning of a wonderful life. It all depends on how you want to see it. Wow. So, so how, um, so did you end up like just getting a, did you go into psychotherapy? Did you get kind of a normal job and, and all this before you started you're, you're, you know, I know you moved to Denver. Yeah, I, I dropped out of school, moved to Colorado and started training. And then eight months, nine months later, climbed Mount Everest. Wow. Wow. So how do you, how do you fund something like that? I've heard, I've heard Everest is not a cheap um, thing to do. It, <laughs> you've done your research. A lot of people say, oh my God, it's so expensive. And, and it is, you know, I've, I've never given away the actual amount, but it's, let's just say it's probably as an ex, as expensive um as costly as an expensive car and i'm not talking like bugatti i'm talking oh. like you know a nice bmw or something so right i actually i sold my entire life savings to do it um i begged i borrowed i pleaded you know i got sponsors and i, I robbed a few banks you know I, I, <laughs> we, we we found we found the right way to make it happen you know, I, uh -huh. when, whenever I have a, a goal in mind, I, I, I'm the type of person who puts on the blinders and I will find a way to make it happen. So the biggest source of income uh, came from a couple, couple sources. One was actually Johnny Walker, which is odd to say, but I was one of the first recipients to help them with their keep walking campaign. And they're still doing that now, you know, Johnny Walker, keep walking. It's that guy with the stick walking everywhere. So I was a recipient of that. And then also when I was born, my mom and my dad invested in some stocks, like stocks and bonds, re reoccurring uh, stocks. And I sold that, which didn't make them exactly happy. But I, I sold my, my everything. I got rid of everything to go follow a dream. That's awesome. That, I mean, that, that makes it even cooler. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, I think I was... I, was, I think it was in David Goggins' book, right? That it's like every trial or battle or whatever makes the story that much better, right? Because it's like, man, if you, if you just, you know, had all this riches and and an easy path to the top of Everest, you know, it's like, well, that's cool. A rich guy summits Everest, but a guy that just, you know, spent 18 years fighting cancer, dropped out of school, sold everything he has to summit Everest. I mean, that's so, that's so badass i just um that's awesome so so then you you summit everest how does that feel first of all like you you actually did it i mean I, like i said i i've i've had that fantasy dream of it but like what's it feel like to actually stand on the top 
I don't know if there's a, a good way to really describe it, to be honest with you. The, the, well, when I, when I made it up there, I collapsed to my hands and knees and I pulled out a flag. Um, it was a silk flag that I had the whole time I was climbing. And a lot of people don't understand how long it takes to climb Everest. I mean, I was up there. I got to base camp April 8th and I summited May 16th. So almost a month and a half, right? Living in a tent, you know, not, not showering for a month and a half, just going up right. and down the mountain. But the entire time I was climbing, I had a flag that had names of people touched by cancer. And it was folded up in my chest pocket every time I was on the mountain as a constant reminder of my goals and, and my purpose, my hope. So when I got to the summit, I collapsed to my knees. I lost it. I was just completely emotional, pulled out that flag and wrapped the flag around the summit of the world. And I, I did that to forever commemorate the struggle of cancer patients worldwide. So when I was up there, the first thought that went through my mind was all the people who've been touched by cancer. You know, the struggles that they're going through, the battles, the, the mountains that they're climbing is because not everyone's going to climb Everest, but everyone has an Everest to climb. And I think for mm -hmm. me, it was really an analogy for life. You know, there's an uphill struggle. However, at the top, once you get there, reach down and pull people up there. So I, I was a, I was an emotional yeah. wreck. And then I realized after about a millisecond, I started looking around thinking to myself, shit, I have to go back down. Like it's a round trip sport. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's coming up to get you. Yeah. When you get up there, That's you're only halfway. Man. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if I'm um, just tying, tying things together. I shouldn't, but I, I think it's interesting that you at 13, your hair's falling out. You fall to your knees with your hands full of hair and you know, you're like weeping there. And then you, make it to the summit of Everest, fall on your knees again as like, you know, a champion, basically. Um, very, very interesting that the way, you know, emotion comes out both for the, the positive and the negative. Um, that's anyway, that's a, that's a cool story, man. Um, so you make it back down. There's, you know, <clears throat> first of all, before I leave Everest, like, what's it like up there? What, is, is it really like a graveyard? Is it really like, do you, do you see people up there? Um, I, I did. I, I stepped over a number of bodies going up the mountain. And it's, it's difficult pushing past those without focusing on them. Because as, as you're going up, you're, you're thinking, you know, somebody died doing what I'm attempting to, to, to accomplish. What and who decides who dies and who doesn't? So why was that person unlucky? Why would I be lucky to accomplish that? I, I don't know. But it, it messes with your head. Yeah. But just like anything, like I said earlier, as opposed to not as opposed to focusing on not dying, I was focusing on focusing on living going up the mountain, I wasn't focused again on not dying. I was focused on making it to the top. How interesting. Wow. So it's, it's like added, added mental challenges when you're, you're getting up there and you st step over someone's foot. You're like what the, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it messes with your head. I mean, there's a guy up there, everybody just calls green boots and you, know, you can see his boots. Um, and it's just obviously the green and it, it, it messes with you because wow you're always just wondering why, like, why did that person die? Why, why won't I die? I, I, I lost a friend on the mountain. He fell 3000 feet into a crevasse when I was up there. And, wow. and, and I remember looking, I remember looking back up at the mountain cause it was a sheet of ice at about a 45 degree angle. And I remember that, um, well, he went up to camp three, on what's called the Lhotse ice face, which is a sheet of ice at a 45 degree angle where you cut in and out to put your tent. And he went up there in a storm, okay. got caught up at camp three in a storm at about 23, 24,000 feet. And he couldn't find his tent. So just hopped in someone else's tent, no food, no water for two days, two nights, delirious on his way down, misclipped on a guide rope. And he tumbled over 3000 feet. And I remember looking back up there and seeing where he landed because the, the snow was blood red and I had to go right wow. past that. So you, you, you just wonder why, 
why someone would die on the mountain and somebody else wouldn't. You, you know, it's, it's just like asking myself why I got cancer. How did I get cancer? I could ask myself that a thousand times over, come up with a thousand different answers. I may never know. Yeah. Focusing on the why can really mess with you. Huh? Um, Absolutely. That's, that's, in, that's intense, man. Your life is wild. <laughs> just out there in the wilderness, just, just risking it all. Um, that is freaking awesome, dude. Uh, so after Everest, what comes next? I know, like I already mentioned in the intro, you've summited all the, 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 top, the highest peak in every continent. Uh, when did that come to your mind and, and what do you do next? That, that actually came, came to mind after Everest. Um, the opportunity to climb Kilimanjaro came up, uh, which is the highest mountain in Africa. And after that, I think seven days later, I climbed the highest mountain in Europe. Um, and I decided, all right, well, there are seven, six other continents, six other high points. Let's do it. You know, it was a, it was a thing. Um, I think it was started by a guy named Dick Bass, who was the owner of, um, Snowbird at the time. And hmm. I decided, okay, well, let's, let's do that. And then let's also take a flag and kind of replicate what I did on Everest, but re replicate that on the highest mountain on every continent. So there's, there's a flag on the highest point of each continent that has names of people touched by cancer. And every year now, I actually take a group up Kilimanjaro as a fundraiser for a cancer charity. And we have a flag that says hope on there. And we do the same thing with names of people. So it's, it, it, it became an homage for, for everyone touched by cancer, but it's grown to really just represent hope to people and help, help them find a deeper purpose for what they're doing. Because no matter, no matter what you're, you're reaching for in life, let's just say Kilimanjaro, the, the highest mountain in Africa, you know, whenever I take people over there, they always, it never fails. There's at least three or four people who have this idea and this mindset, and this concept of, oh, I'm going to conquer that mountain. I mean, if it's you versus mother nature, she's going to kick your ass every single time. You, know, you, you don't have a choice. So you don't, you don't conquer the mountain. She allows you up there. What you do is you, you, you learn to conquer yourself. So it's more of what I've, what I've, I've coined this new term it's an inspiration. It's an inward journey through an outward adventure. So when people are going for, say, whatever goal it might be, they, they want a new car, a new house, um, a raise, more money, whatever it might be, it's never about the thing. It's, the, it's what that thing represents. So for a lot of people who are going out for the summit, they realize, you know, it's, let's just say there was a, there was a lady I took up just this past February where she had always gone 80%. She's never pushed herself that 100%. And if you look at it, you either make it to the summit or you don't. That 100% or you, you don't. So she finally pushed herself to 100%. And that represented her overcoming her self-limitations. You know, when somebody goes after, an, uh, say, a raise, they want more money. It's never about the money. Maybe they want to, they want it, they want the security that it represents or the, the uh, extra time with family to go on vacation. So if you find a proper meaning behind the goal that you have, you're going to, you're not going to just inspire yourself. You're going to empower yourself, which is why I think I've been so successful in these mountains because it's never been about the summit. It's always been about the journey and what it represents to myself and others. I like the way you said that, you don't inspire yourself, you empower yourself. It's like one is, one's an action, one, one, uh, makes you capable of, of accomplishing and one is I'm motivated. I'm excited. <laughs> An empowerment lasts forever. Because once you find a deeper purpose, once you find a deeper meaning, you have stronger passion to go after it. Now you have this ability. Um, that's, that's cool. So your Kilimanjaro trips explain, you know, explain to the audience, those, the, that you take people up there every year, right? And you've been up how many? 21, 22 times? Where are you at now? This 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 past trip was 22 and it it started off as a fundraiser for a cancer charity where we paid for a survivor's trip every year. All cost covered. And it, then it was the responsibility of that survivor to raise funds for next year's survivor, paying it forward and keeping in the cancer family. 
which I thought was a, a really cool model. Um, anyone could go. So this year in February, we actually tested out what we call the ultimate life climb. And that in turn became the world's first expedition, which I mentioned previously. So one of the reasons I did that was because first of all, the success rate on Kilimanjaro for the mountain is 48%. So 52 people out of hundred don't even make the summit. My groups were at 98, wow. 99% success rate. So we're double the average. And then I also, you know, give, wow. giving keynote, keynote presentations and, and working with corporations around the world, people have always come up to me after my talks and they've, they've shared their story, which I love. I love hearing other people's stories and you get to connect on a personal level. But there, there have always, always been a handful of people who took it a step further by asking, how did you do it? So that planted the seed. And then I started putting two and two together with the fact that we have double the success rate on Kilimanjaro. How did I do what I did? Go crawling eight feet from the hospital bed to go on to do these crazy things. Then I put that into an online program called the Big Hill Challenge, which then represents what we do on the mountain. And each day, there are certain metaphors for the mountain that reflect back in life. So it's it's an amazing, literally amazing life-changing journey. And we're going to go in again in July and then probably February of 2023. What, you're starting to do them twice a year now? Is that <laughs> what's going on? Because I've, I've heard you say you go every July, but I mean, we're communicating right now in March and you just got back, right? Correct. Just got, yep. Just, just returned just a couple weeks ago, going back up in July, and then we're going to do another one in probably the end of January, early February of next year. So we're going to we're going to, we're going to try to do it twice a year now. Twice a year. And how do you? How many people are in this? And like, do you, is there like a selection process? Or is it kind of anyone that's up for it? It's it's good to go. How, how's that work? I've I've taken as few as six people and as many as thirty, which I'll I'll never take thirty again. It was just. The people were great. It was just trying to corral cats on the mountain, and it was just, it was just miserable. Right. So logistics, it didn't work out very well. So we're gonna we're always gonna cap it, no more than twelve or fifteen people. Um, it's it's open to pretty much anybody who who's not a stick in the mud, you know, who who loves adventure, mm -hmm. who loves getting out there, who's a fun individual, but also someone who's looking to push themselves past their comfort zone and into an amazing life. People who want to challenge themselves. People who potentially, I've, I've worked with a number of, of multimillionaires and a handful of billionaires with coaching and, and other things. And I've realized mm -hmm. through that coaching, a lot of people on the outside have everything. They seem successful. They seem to be happy. They seem to have, you know, four or five houses and they think, from the outside, oh, that person must be living the life of their dreams. When in all actuality, those people are miserable because again, they think those houses, those cars, and in some cases, the new wife is going to bring them happiness. It doesn't. Happiness is an internal job. And anyone who's looking right. for something more, anyone who's looking for some sort of purpose, then this trip is 100% for them. We do a seven day up, up and down the mountain and then we fly into the Serengeti and do a four day safari, which is really cool. That sounds amazing. Um, so on that topic of like, you know, the happiness and like people trying to find it in the wrong places sometimes, I've, I've occasionally thrown this out there and you can tell me what's right or wrong with it. But like sometimes we need, we need real contrast in life to to have perspective right and so sometimes especially in today's society i mean i i've worked from home for like six years now uh and and you can get really comfortable but that doesn't make you happy comfort right uh what you need is like i always tell people you should put yourself through some intentional suffering and in a good way like like i took a cold shower this morning and like go exercise until you're, you know, really kind of suffering, right? Whether it's your lungs are burning or your muscles are hurting or however, you know, an endurance race where it's like, you've got to have some, some real stick to itiveness. like those kinds of moments, uh, or days give you some, some perspective and contrast of what, 
your comforts really are and uh, you know the joy of being with your family and the uh, uh, fact that you're healthy and well you know like uh, you can really forget to appreciate those things if you're spending too much time in a chair you know um, so like is that what you get from these killy trips like are you, you know hiking up a 19,000 foot mountain <laughs> I would say in a sense, in a way, yes, because really there, there are no comforts on the mountain. And yeah. the, the cool thing is you could have someone who is a multi-billionaire or someone who's homeless. When you start the trip, every single person starts the same place. It, it is the greatest equalizer. So as, as you're going up the mountain, yeah, it's it's going to be miserable. You you have no idea what the weather's going to be like. You know, you have no idea what the terrain's going to be like. No idea what the summit night if there's going to be a torrential downpour, a snowstorm, 90 mile an hour winds, you have no clue. But it's all there's always that opportunity to choose how you want to react to it. And then also going back to the metaphor, you know, there, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. It all depends on how you're planning for it, how, how you're ready for it. So if you have the right mental attitude, of course, you're going to have a great time. But if you have the wrong mental attitude, or I, I wouldn't say wrong, but a negative mental attitude, you're going to be miserable. However, when you are miserable, when you when you are just this past trip, uh, it, it was, I think we hit every type of precipitation you can imagine it's like snow grapple hail rain sleet and 50 mile an hour winds Every, at, at one point everybody was miserable and then we we kind of got yeah. together i was like look you, you know we, we can really truly appreciate yesterday because it was a beautiful sunny day and we all have the opportunity to see what's happening to us now and react how we want i know you're uh, i know you're in colorado right and i I went hunting in Colorado last season. We, it, it sounds a lot like that. I mean, we had freaking rain for days and we're up there trying to hike our, hike our asses up and down this hill. And then, um, finally I, you know, I, I was able to harvest the deer and we put it in our packs and walk back out, you know, in the snow. And, um, uh, it's like, for some reason, those moments are, just i don't know they're so memorable there's there are things that sort of change you you know at least temporarily you just go like that was that was awesome right the suffering for some reason is i, I call it suffering you're not like i mean it's not like suffering right um it's it's a challenge or it's it's inconvenient uh it's probably a better way to say it but uh very cool um you know, why I, I, why killy why do you I was, I was, I was going to say, I, I've always had, and a lot, a lot of people have this notion too, and it sounds like you do as well. There, there seems like there are two types of fun. One, like type A or type B fun. Type A fun is like in the moment, you're on a roller coaster. You're like, whoo, this is great, you know, zipping around. And then type B fun is in the moment, you're miserable, but afterwards you look back at it and think to yourself, yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. My, my son's favorite walk to school was a day that we call Hoth. Cause it was like, it was a sideways blizzard coming in, you know, and there was banks on the sidewalk and everything. And, and he's like, dad, are you going to drive me to school? I'm like, no, man, we're, we're trekking it. You know, it's going to be a good time. And, and it ended up being like a memory that he just, he thinks it was the best day ever, you know? And, uh, he was only like, he was only like nine, you know? So, uh, it was a good time, but those, those kind of moments are, uh, things you remember forever, you know, instead of just, like I say, like the comfort of our couches that we live in, it's just, that just all kind of gets blurred together. So why, why do you go up Kilimanjaro every year? Like there's so many mountains to climb. Uh, I mean, the, the safari sounds awesome and all that, but like what makes Kilimanjaro the, the destination? Well, Kil Kilimanjaro is, is, it's very accessible. It's a bucket list for so many people. It is because it's accessible. It is very safe in the fact that if something happens, you can be off the mountain in a few hours. 
It's a mm -hmm. trekking peak. There's no technical, the route we go up, there's no, nothing tactical about it. And it just lends itself to success and one of the greatest adventures that I've always been on. That and obviously, like you said, the safari, but I love the culture. I love the people. And I've used the same guides, the same porters, the same cook, the same everything for the past 21 trips up the mountain. So they literally adopted me into the Chugga tribe and we support the locals every year we're there. And, and we're not treated, say you, you go with me, they, they treat you like family. So I, I love seeing the transition in people. So I, I know I can make it, you know, this, this was my 22nd trip up the mountain. And I think you get to, a, I don't want to say an age, but a stage in your life when it's, it's very, very similar to, for me, to Christmas. So I don't need anything, but I love seeing what giving to others does. It's like when my wife opens up a Christmas gift or birthday gift and seeing her face light up, you know, I get something out of that. I love making her happy. Same thing with yeah. Kilimanjaro. When I get up there, I still cry like a baby because it's so emotional and we're still taking a flag up there. But I love seeing, and this is going to sound really bad, I love seeing other people cry. I love seeing the emotional change in them in an instant. So giving back and helping others, helping empower others is one of the main reasons why we do it. Wow. That's powerful. That's cool. So tell me, tell me more about your, um, big hill challenge. What's, what's that? I know that's something you continue to do and, and something you developed, but, uh, <laughs> how does that, you know, how, how can we all participate? It is it, just shoot me an email, Sean at cancerclimber.org or go to, I think it's the big hill And it, it came to fruition because I've been doing a lot of coaching. I've been working with uh, corporations like, like Google, Unilever. Um, there's one called Perno Rickard, which they're the second largest alcohol distribution company in the, in the world. So some, some big names. And what it does is it helps guide you through your personal core values to make conscious, mindful decisions through repetition like using the mindfulness, using the compound effect. And it's, it's, it's unlike anything that's out there, because if, if you look at the program, the online programs, what happens is you have a, a, a guru, you have someone saying, Hey, this is what you need to do. A plus B equals C. It worked for that person. It might not work for you. So as opposed to someone telling you what to do, again, you become more empowered by figuring it out on your own. It's, it's only three weeks long, but in those three weeks, you learn how to do it yourself. So it's utilizing your personal core values to help you find deeper purpose in life and more happiness. I mean, it's it's not rocket science, but it, it'll change your life. I had a guy go through it. He was a CEO of a large corporation. And he said for the first time in 20 years, he's no longer on the hamster wheel. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it changed his life. Right. Um. That's awesome. So everyone go check that out. The big hill challenge. And then you're also an author. <clears throat> I have your book right here. Unfortunately, I only got it uh, yesterday, so I didn't get the chance to read it before our interview, but uh, I don't know if you've listened to any of the, this podcast, but we do book reviews all the time. And so uh, this will be one on the, you know, the list in the future. So uh, I encourage everyone to check that out as well. It's called being unstoppable conquering your Everest. So, um, so what are you up to nowadays? I mean, just the big hill challenge, is that kind of your new thing or is, is there any, any other big plans you're working on that you can share it at the moment? Big hill challenges is, is up there. Uh, keynote presentations are up there They're, because people are starting to get back together in uh, live for live events. Mm -hmm. uh, in May, we just booked three keynote presentations June, cool. June, I'm heading to Slovenia for a presentation and Croatia for a presentation, then back home for a couple weeks before going back to Kilimanjaro for another trip. Looking at taking a group up to Everest Base Camp in October. And then I'm hoping if everything goes well, 
in January 2023, I'm going to run seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. Oh, man, that's awesome. <clears throat> that's cool. Uh, you you may have heard of the, the Iron Cowboy. He lives down the down the road here from me, and he's, you know, he's one of those people like you and Colin Brady and, and the Iron Cowboy and Goggins. Y'all just like, man, you come up with these things, and I'm just like, ah, I got to. I got to step my game up, man. Like everything in my life, yours is just like so many levels above. It's like, I rupture my spleen, you conquer cancer. Like <laughs> I, I, my, my sister-in-law gets cancer. I write a song about cancer, right? Uh, like I win the 400 meter dash, you win the 800. Uh, I hike, I, <laughs> I hunt in the mountains of Utah and Colorado, you summit all the the summits of the of every continent it's like man but, i got up but, my game here so but, but life life is not a competition right one of the things <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the things my parents taught me at such a young age because i was a competitive swimmer God, since five or six i think i still have records from 80 88 or 89 maybe 90 but they always taught me that i never had to be the best i had to be my best so i had to set the bar for myself because as soon as you start comparing yeah. yourself to others, you start becoming like them. You start losing who you are. You start incorporating some of their personal core values. And as opposed to following your own dreams and goals, now all of a sudden you want to keep up with the Joneses and do what the other person, your neighbor's doing. When you <laughs> And then you lose yourself, right? So you have to focus on right. what you want because otherwise, if you, otherwise you might not be happy. You, because you said earlier, you're like I, you never go up up Everest because you have a family, you know, and your priorities change as you go through life. So if you focus on what matters most to you, you're always going to be happy. But as soon as you start going after, like I don't, I'm not, I, I have no desire to have the the world record in in pull ups. You know, zero desire to do that. Goggins can keep that. I, I, I can give to you know what about that. Yeah. Good for him. That's great. Yeah. You beat him in the Hawaii Ironman, though. So, you know, I guess that's a challenge. <laughs> However, <laughs> when, when you're funny. doing what you want to do, what you're designed in, what you're focused on that you, brings you happiness, that's all that matters. Yeah. No, great call out there. Way to call me out on that. I'm just kidding. I was joking anyway. But um, it's a great point, though. You know, it's like, you know, we all have we all have strengths and weaknesses in our own way and being the best version of ourselves is really what's going to bring happiness, right? It's not having more money than someone or having the the pull-up record or whatever. It's like, if, if that's your desire to see how many pull-ups you can do, then that, that may make you happy, but it, right. It's like, so what is it that you, you want to accomplish with the gifts and talents you've been given and how can you serve the people around you and the world around you and make an impact? And, and, uh, it doesn't have to be what someone else did or at their level. It's, it's your own, your own thing. Um, so I like that, but man, I, I could talk to you for hours. I think, you know, I, I would love more detail on every little trip and aspect of this. Maybe one day I'll, I'll have to, get on one of those Kelly trips with you. Um, I've already started working on, on, you know, I'm priming my wife for that. It's like, right. he invited me on July. So I got, you know, I got a few months to train. Um, I have a one year old that makes it, that makes it harder for mom to stay at home for two weeks. But um, that's something that you've, you've got my wheel spinning, man. So, um, Anyway, I, I have enjoyed this. I appreciate you coming on with me. And, uh, you know, anytime you've, you've got a new event coming, you're welcome to come back and we'll, we'll help promote that and, and spend some time together. But uh, thank you again and have an awesome, has, awesome next trip to Killy. Hey, my pleasure, man. And yeah, absolutely. Plant, plant the seed. When we get done here, it's like, hey, you know, I just, I just heard about this trip I might want to take, you know, it's, it's over in Africa. It's, it's an easy hike, you know, it's, it'd be a wonderful challenge and it's a life changing opportunity. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. I, I, literally the day you messaged me, I was like, babe, I got a trip to Kilimanjaro in July. <laughs> so 
Uh, so we're working on it. Uh, nice. Anyway, well, thank you awesome so much. Answer. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Have a good one.